Today we talk about the new Autobahn and this is probably the most controversial subject I had in all my lecture series up to now. The new Autobahn and the speed trains that I'm talking today about is revolutionizing our way of mobility. That's at least what I believe. So this is the lecture number 30. And before we talk about the details of the speed tram and the new Autobahn, I want to remind you what we learned last lecture and there we talked in more general ways about the future of mobility. Here we argued that we have to reduce greenhouse gases and fossil fuels and therefore I propose this five-step program written down here. We have to reduce the number of goods which are transported. We have to reduce the number of people which are transported. We should do small distances by walking and by light vehicles, like a bicycle or a small electric car. For the big cities, we need subways. And last not least, the point number five is about the speed tram and the new autobahn. And this I will explain you now in detail. We have this speed tram for passengers. We have a speed tram for cargo and we have the concept to put rails on the autobahn, on the highway. Before I go to more technical details, I would like to show you how the world in future would look like when there are speed trams everywhere. So how to use the speed tram in future? Well, you just take your app on your mobile phone, you type in from where to where you want to go, at which time and with what kind of comfort and what kind of extras, and then you ask for a tram to come to you. So the concept is that you order the tram on demand, so the trams don't run around day and night with empty seats but they are only running on demand. It is similar from the concept which, for example, Uber is using. You all know these Uber apps where you can order a private driver to pick you up and bring you somewhere. So for the speed tram, you do something similar. In every village and in every quarter of a town, there should be a tram line. And then you just order with your app that the tram is coming to you and if possible bring you to your final destination non-stop. For example, uh, from my village here close to Gießen up to a suburb in Dresden, for example, a few hundred kilometers away. One of the choices is the choice of comfort which you will get. So for example, if you are an elderly person or if you have a lot of luggage, you want to be picked up at home and brought to the final destination so that there's not additional long travel between the station and your home and vice versa. So that is the advantage of the speed tram that you can really order on demand from which position to which position the tram should bring you. So it's almost as comfortable as if you have your own car which is in front of your house. Of course, a lot of people don't require that. So if you are young and you like to walk or take your bicycle, it's no problem for you to go to a big tram station and then the tram will pick you up there and bring you to another tram station. Maybe it also transports your bike. And then, uh, of course, you can have a cheaper fare because the tram has less trouble with you. Of course, we also need a luggage service because the aim, of course, is that the future tram system is as comfortable as a private car. And now comes the good thing about the speed tram. In a tram, there's a lot of space and you can have a lot of extras there. For example, if I choose to visit a friend in Dresden in the next morning, I can take a night tram and I order a sleep cabin, for example. So it will probably not look like on this picture here because this comes from the old days where sleep cabins were still uh, in use. The future speed tram will have more modern compartments, of course, but you get a feeling on how it will look like. Of course, if you drive during the day, you might want to have a quiet office table with internet and laptops somewhere. Or you might go with your colleagues on a business trip and then you want to have a small meeting room in your speed tram. All that should be possible and should not cost so much extra. Another important thing is you probably know there are always people who talk on the phone all the time and they annoy all the passengers around. So in the future speed tram, we need the possibility to have small cabins 
where you can have extensive video conferences or phone calls without disturbing the other passengers. And of course, everybody who has been traveling with children knows that it is really uh, not very easy to travel on a long trip with children because they don't want to sit on a chair for five hours or so. So what's very important is that you have special cabins for children, which have, for example, a kind of indoor playground, but also adult people might want to have a gym there or a massage area or even a nice restaurant where they can have a nice dinner after work or an after work party or something like a pub atmosphere where you can, according to the motto, drink and ride, not drink and drive, have some beer and some music if you want. So all that is possible in a future where you travel without having to drive yourself. So why is this tram called speed tram? Well, let's talk about the secret of speed. Why are train rides usually so awfully time consuming? Well, you all know that the first step is you have to go to the train station. For that, in the ideal case, you take a taxi, but most people take public transport. They have to take buses, change at a bus station or a subway station, and then they go to the train. They have to be there early enough. So that is the first step where you lose a lot of time. The same, of course, happens in, when you arrive at the final destination and from there you have to use public transport to the place where you finally want to go. The next thing is, for longer train rides, you normally have to change trains one or two times in between. And in a lot of time, the changeover is not synchronized and or you just miss the train and you have to wait for one hour to get the next train. So that is time consuming. And last but not least, if you take a normal train, even if it's a high speed train, the high speed train takes a lot of time for traveling because it stops at every main station. And this many stops, of course, take also a lot of time. If you have 10 stops in between and each stop is five minutes, you have already 50 minutes lost. So it does not help if your train has 300 or 350 kilometer per hour. If it loses the time in all these intermediate stops, uh, you don't really gain. And of course, these trains have a slow acceleration and they have long braking distance. If you have a high speed train, uh, it normally has only a short distance where it can have full speed and then already it goes slowly into a town and then coming slowly out of the town again. All that makes traveling so slow and it's typically, even with fast trains, slower than if you take your own car. And that's one of the reasons why everybody takes his or her own car. The concept of the speed train is different here. So the secret of speed for the speed train is that it does not stop on long rides in between. So how does it work? Well, at the starting region, it starts to collect the passengers. This, of course, takes some time. And at the final destination, it also gives out the passengers by riding around in the region and putting these passengers out. But the important thing is that for a long distance traveling, the speed train goes non-stop. So imagine it goes from my village here close to Gießen to Dresden and in the suburb of Dresden. It takes some time to collect the people in the area of Gießen. And then it goes on the autobahn and then it drives on the autobahn with a speed of, for example, 130 kilometers per hour, non-stop to Dresden. And then only in Dresden, it goes off the autobahn and starts to distribute the people around. So you have a non-stop traveling on the long distances. And that, of course, gives you a very short traveling time, even shorter than with a car because in a car you normally have to stop over if you want to go to the toilet or if you want to eat something. And in cars you typically have traffic jams several times on your ride, whereas the speed tram avoids all that. And the final thing is that the speed tram can use the dense autobahn connections in Germany, for example, also in other countries, which is a lot more dense than the 
rail system. If you go by normal train, there are normally deviations because there are not rails on the direct connection to the town where you want to go. But there's a second category of losing time in train rides, and this is about the frequency of trains. In the train system nowadays, there are trains going to a certain destination maybe 10 times a day. Sometimes if it's a further distance, you have only one or two trains per day which you can choose. Sometimes, of course, there are more options, but in any case, you normally have to wait some time before you have the opportunity to take a train to some destination. On the other hand, on the highway, if you take an ordinary highway in Germany, uh, you have something like 100,000 cars per day, for example. You have on the order of 100,000 passengers per day. You have, to, of course, to correct for cars where there is more than one person. And you have to correct for lorries and trucks, which have usually only goods and no person which they have to transport. So the order of magnitude is 100,000 cars per day on one highway. And of course, if you replace the cars and the lorries by trams, you have to have the same order of magnitude of passengers. So you will have again 100,000 passengers per day, which requires a speed tram every about one or two minutes. So basically, if you wait for the next tram, it takes one or two minutes on a certain highway. In other words, you have a lot more new possibilities. So you have the possibility that you can have direct connection from a certain town A to a certain town B, because in direction of East Germany, for example, there is a train every one or two minutes. You just wait for half an hour and, and then you can select the direct train from, for example, Frankfurt to Dresden. So in this sense, the trains on demand only become possible because there are so many passengers and there will be so many trains in future so that you can select the direct train. Of course, this requires something which a physicist would call a phase transition. The system of individual cars is very efficient nowadays. In future, there might be the speed tram system be very efficient. But to go from one system to the other system, as I said, we call a phase transition. So it's an unstable situation, which only will happen if you have energy from outside, or in this case, if there's money and pressure from the government or from the people who say, we want this new system by itself in a capitalistic system, it will not come out. So this phase transition requires an additional external force, uh, which makes sure that the current stable system is abolished and the new stable system, which then hopefully is much better, is brought into life. So what kind of infrastructure do we need in this future world of speed trams? So first of all, you need rails on all major roads. These rails could be uh, the same time as we have nowadays, which are made out of steel. But of course, you can think about a future new material, some compound material, which replaces the steel, which might be more suitable and maybe cheaper. There are so many new kinds of materials that I would not say that also in the long term future, it will always be steel, it could be some carbon fibers or whatever. The second part of the infrastructure are the overhead lines. You all have seen electric trains or electric trams. So the standard overhead line is probably the best and the easiest way to do it. One additional thing is important. There might be areas where overhead lines are not possible or not wanted. One example are old towns, historic towns. A lot of these towns abolished trams because they didn't like the overhead lines. Another reason might be that there are some existing bridges or tunnels for the cars where an overhead line does not fit because the ceiling is not high enough. So for those areas, all the speed trams need batteries. So with these batteries, they can run for a few kilometers, maybe for a few tenths of kilometers without overhead lines by their own batteries. And of course, the batteries are charged as soon as the trams go back to an overhead line. I talked about this phase transition, so the transition from our current system to the speed tram system. 
There are ways to make this transition easier because it's clear the speed tram system becomes only attractive if you can go everywhere in Germany or in the countries around. Otherwise, people want to keep their cars because they say if we want to go on holidays, we need our car. So if we need it for the holidays, we also take it for every day. So to ease the transition, because it takes time to put rails everywhere on the highways and on the roads, for that, we need a stepwise transition. And one way the transition could be is in these four steps written down here. The first step is you have more standard buses or in future maybe electrical buses with batteries which are charged at bus stops. And for that, you don't need any rails. The next step then is you take trolley buses as we had in the past. So these trolley buses can also have a hybrid system that they have batteries for the region where there is no overhead line, but mostly they take overhead lines and then they get the electrical power in the most direct and most efficient way. I was pleased to hear that in my neighboring town in Marburg, they just installed such a hybrid system where they install trolley buses which have a battery and they can use the overhead lines which they will newly install in the town and at the same time they can also partially go with batteries. The next step in this direction is something which I think was invented by the Chinese. So in China they have trams which don't need rails. So basically as you see on this picture here it's a tram which has normal wheels but it runs autonomously so they call it the autonomous rail rapid transit. These things which look and work like a tram, they run on a normal road and they just have these white double lines here, these dashed lines, and the train automatically follows these dashed lines here with a camera. So this is a kind of autonomous uh, steering wheel which is no problem to make nowadays. So you can call this kind of white lines virtual rails and the train will follow that. These trains run here with batteries, but of course you can have a similar system like a trolley bus. So you can also have these trains here running with overhead lines. And then you are always there. The next step then is to what I call the speed tram. So you replace these virtual rails by real rails and then we have our speed tram. The advantage of course is that then the friction is less and the trams on rails of course will have less electricity consumption than these ones here but also these trams here on normal wheels have already a very good energy efficiency. Now we come to the next aspect which is safety. So the trams on the autobahn, they should have their own lane. So my proposal is that the two left lanes, which are usually for taking over, are reserved for the tram and the rails are on this lane. And in addition, there should be guard railings, which make sure that if there's an accident with a car, it does not easily go on the tracks so that the tram is normally not affected by this kind of car accidents. The number of accidents with car is really large and we all accept it more or less, even though I think one could easily reduce this number of accidents. Most of the reasons for accidents is that the drivers are not fit, mostly for example because they took alcohol. Some drivers are texting while they are driving and a lot of drivers go with a speed which is too high and they go too close to the car in front of them. That are, I guess, the main reasons for accidents that could be changed, for example, by reducing the allowed speed and those kind of things, but this is not our subject here. So in Germany in 2019, before the Corona crisis, we had something like 170,000 registered accidents on highway and those I think we have to take care by this guard railing mostly. In general about 3,000 people are killed on the roads in one year. The train system in contrast is much safer and this year there was only one passenger killed in a train. But of course um, pedestrians uh, are killed by trains 
It was in total in this year 146 pedestrians. A lot of them were suiciders, uh, which um, decided to be killed by a fast train. For safety, the speed tram will have the following system. First of all, the whole logistics, the whole control has to be centralized, of course. So the track switches are all centralized. You have a traffic control. Uh, you have a speed control according to the weather and the conditions. So all this nowadays will be computer controlled uh, and this will really be big data. So this is a challenging task, but of course it's not really a problem if you think about air traffic control. This is also working nicely and the traffic control on the railways will be a similar task. Then, of course, if you have several trams in the same autobahn on the same direction, you can couple them and then you have fewer and longer trains, which is good for the energy consumption and it's also easier for the logistics of controlling the trains. Then, of course, every train should have GPS and it should have a radar like the modern cars so that you always see the distance to the tram in front and of course this also works if it's raining or if there's fog. The trams will not have a driver so they will run autonomously and to run a tram autonomously of course is much easier than to have an autonomous car because the tram just has to make sure that there is nothing in front of it and anyway it has no possibility to steer the steering of the tram is done centralized so the autonomous tram is not really a difficulty compared to autonomous cars that is the main message here but of course there might be difficult situations for example if there is a construction going on on the rails or if there is an accident in the area you have to have some person responsible for that tram a similar thing might be if you drive downtown and there's a lot of pedestrians, maybe you don't want to have the tram working autonomously completely. So for that case, you can have remote pilots, they have a camera, it's working over the cellular network and then with the camera, the remote pilot can control the tram in difficult situations. Also, that should not be a problem nowadays. So these are already main features of the speed tram. Now I want to give you a few more aspects of the tram. First of all, of course, the tram has an electric engine and electric motor because of high efficiencies. This motor also works as a generator for recuperation. So if the tram goes downhill or if it's breaking, all the energy which it had before is recovered and put back to the grid or to the battery. I told you already that all the trams need batteries for those areas of the journey where there is no overhead line. Another change compared to the standard trains is the trams have to be able to have the partially steep highways. So a highway has higher slopes and the train has to be prepared for that. A standard train which has a locomotive in front and then a lot of cars behind which have no own engine is such a train is usually not able to go up a steep mountain. What you need in the tram is something similar like a four-wheel drive in a car. So you have to have an engine at basically all axes to be able to go up a steeper slope. What does steep mean? Well, the usual highways, I think, have slopes of probably less than 5%. The highest in Germany, I think, is 8%. Typical rains have less than 2.5%, I learned, and trams up to 6%. But there are examples, like I've been in Lissabon once on the historic trams. They have a much higher slope if they go up in the small roads in the old town. And they still do it without rack wheels, so it's a standard tram which is just made suitable to have this steep ascent.
Then, of course, the tram has to be allowed to go with a speed of 130 km per hour. It could also be 120, but it should be a speed which is comparable to what standard cars can do nowadays. This, of course, requires to change a lot of these laws which regulate uh, train systems. And, of course, the other point which is important is that these trains use what we could call a press current braking which means they have to know at which speed the train in front is running, which is of course no problem if it's all centralized. So if, as soon as the train ahead starts to brake, the train behind has to start to brake at the same time. So in this sense, as long as there's not a real accident on the track, there's no danger that these high-speed trains can collide because their braking distance is too large. The next argument which probably will pop out is the question of costs. So who should pay all that? We have to change all our highways. We have to buy all these trams and so on. This will be, of course, a big financial investment because we have to change our infrastructure. But we have to change most of our fossil industry and of our fossil infrastructure anyway. There's no way around it. The only important thing is that the investment we do now will last and will not be replaced again in 20 years. So if we switch, for example, to a hydrogen-driven car, I'm pretty sure that in 20 years we realize that this is very inefficient compared to a real electric car and we will have to change our infrastructure again. So therefore, the only important thing is Will that, what we build up now, will be suitable for the next future, which means for the next 50 or 100 years? And I'm sure that if we build trams and rails at a large scale, it will be basically as cheap as cars and lorries and uh, roads, because it will be mass production, there will be the economy of scale, and there is no reason why a tram is more expensive than a truck, even if that is the case today. The next point is that we will use much less vehicles if we have a speed tram system, because the speed tram system is shared by all passengers, whereas the individual cars are just driven by one or two people. We will need a lot less parking space and a lot less material so this is more sustainable than the individual cars, certainly. I also believe that on the long term, the maintenance will be much cheaper because the maintenance of the rails means basically you have to maintain this five or ten centimeters of metal and of course the holding structure for it. But for a highway, uh, this is like 10 or 20 meters wide. I guess it's even 30 meters. I'm not quite sure now. Therefore, a priori, um, the amount of material you need and the amount of maintenance you need should be easier with rails. And last not least, if you build highways, normally you have to use bitumen for the surface. And bitumen is a product of the fossil industry. In future, when we don't dig for oil anymore, we will also not have bitumen anymore at least no cheap bitumen, so probably it will not even be possible easily anymore to have the kind of roads we have today. So now we come to the biggest argument against my ideas. Aside from the automotive industry, of course, all the car users don't like that. All the people who like to drive on an autobahn or on a highway why is that? Because in the system I propose, the cars have much less space on the road and they are not priority anymore. So there is on a normal highway, there's only one lane left over for the cars. That means you cannot overtake a car anymore on the highway, which means you have to drive in a convoy. There has to be a fixed speed of all cars, which they have to obey. Unless there is a bad weather condition, I would propose that all cars have to drive, for example, 100 km per hour if they are on the highway. Then there's no need to overtake a car anymore. There will be a lot less accidents. But of course, uh, you cannot drive like crazy anymore. The next problem is that, of course, all the driveways and exit lanes, they have to be shared with a speed tram and speed tram must have priority. So there will in future be traffic lights 
on the highway at every exit and you have to wait until you have a green light before you can continue on the highway because otherwise you might collide with a tram. In the ideal case, of course, you change all the entry points for the tram in a way that you build additional bridges or tunnels for the cars or for the tram so that there is no crossing of cars and tram on the motorways. This, of course, is possible, but this, of course, requires an additional effort of construction at each of these exit points and at the crossing of two highways. So that is how the individual cars are affected. Now I come back to the transport. So I mentioned already, as well as there are passenger trams, there should be cargo trams. These cargo trams can do all this medium and long distance transports also internationally. So these trams connect factories, large shops, post offices and new distribution centers which can be on the greenfield but which can also be in the middle of the towns and in the small villages. So probably in future big companies will have their own rail connection again like they had it 50 or 100 years ago. And of course these cargo trams should have the possibility to be coupled to passenger trams because then this way, of course, uh, you can build long trains which have less air drags and which use less energy this way. Last not least, I come to another very important aspect of the speed tram. And this aspect is about the national electricity system of a country. First of all, uh, by using the speed tram, I'm confident that you can save a factor of 10 or even more compared to the individual traffic by cars and trucks. So this, of course, is good for the energy transition. It is comparable from going from a normal light bulb for producing light to an LED system. This is also about a factor of 10. The same factor of 10 which we saved in electricity for light, we now can also save in electricity for transport. The second point where the speed tram affects the energy transition on the national scale is that I propose to have in between the two rails in the middle of the highway to have a supply road with cables and these cables on the one hand could be optical fibers to cover all the big data transport which we will have in future but more importantly we can use these supply pipes also for high voltage DC power lines because you all know for the intermittent renewable energies we need to transport for example in Germany from the north to the south electrical energy by using high voltage DC powers and for that of course we need a lot of new overhead high voltage lines and a lot of people don't like it because it additionally takes away areas where there's nature before or where the people don't like it because it's in their backyard. What I propose instead is to put these cables, so high voltage DC lines, maybe even at different high voltage levels in these supply pipes between the two rails. First of all, between the two rails there is space and secondly it's space which is not accessible by people normally so I don't see any safety aspect which would prevent to have these high voltage lines underground in between the rails. And last not least the next very important addition which the speed trams do for the national electricity grid is that each of the tram has batteries and each of the batteries is normally directly connected to the overhead lines, which means it's directly connected to the national grid. It's all remote control, so at any time when there's an instability in the national electricity grid, the batteries of these hundreds or thousands or in future hundreds thousands of trams all these batteries can be connected to the grid and support the electricity supply. And in the same way, if there's too much electricity because the sun is shining and there's a lot of wind at our coast, the surplus electricity power can go back through the overhead lines of the trams into their batteries. So the batteries of the speed trams can be used as short-term storage for the national grid. So these batteries have a double use. 
they are used for the national grid, for stability, and secondly, they are used, of course, for the trends for all the areas where there is no overhead line. So I hope I convinced you and you are all now a fan of the speed tram. So to summarize, why is the speed tram such a great idea? Well, first of all, it reduces the energy in the transport sector by about a factor of 10. Secondly, you don't have to drive yourself. So traveling is much more comfortable. You can even drink some alcohol if you want. But more importantly, you can spend the traveling by talking to people, by surfing in the internet or by playing games or whatever. Thirdly, it's sure that there will be less accidents, there will be less pollution, there will be less microplastic because you don't have standard tires here. Very important is that you don't have additional land use for railways, otherwise if you would need additional land for the railways, there's not much land free in Germany anymore for nature. Also important is that the process of getting the land and the permittance to build new railways on the green field uh, will take decades in Germany. And this would be much too late for a traffic transition. Then, as I just explained, of course, the batteries in the trains, which are connected to overhead lines, stabilize the national grid, which is one of the very important and the very expensive pieces of the energy transition. And last not least, of course, we have a lot new challenges. We have a lot new jobs. First of all, we have to have people who build all the infrastructure. And secondly, we have to have all these people who are intelligent and are able to do big data to do remote control and all this stuff, which is a very ambitious task, of course. So this is the end of this lecture. If you want to learn more about mobility, go back to the previous lectures where I explained some of the basic principles and also the physics of the energy of transport. And otherwise, if you like my ideas or if you oppose against them, please put comments here into my YouTube channel, because I think as this idea is rather new, we have to have a lot of discussions to find out if this is really the way to go in future. And if this is the way to go in future, we have to convince other people and to convince the politicians and the industry to go this way. Thank you and see you next time. Goodbye.